Aloha, my name is Julie Mitchell, and I am the Executive Director here at Kuikahi Mediation Center. Welcome to our Finding Solutions, Growing Peace Brown Bag Lunch series. Many of you have been to our talks before, and some of you are newcomers, so I always like to introduce a little bit about who we are and what we do. Kuikahi is a nonprofit community mediation center. We serve East Hawaii on Hawaii Island or the Big Island. That's where you've been seeing uh, the volcano going off. If you watch the news and you're not living on our island. Kuikahi was founded back in 1983 as a program of the island of Hawaii YMCA. And in 2006, we became our own independent nonprofit. So we're 39 years old this year. Our mission is to empower people to come together, to talk and to listen, to explore options, and to find their own best solutions. And to achieve this mission, we offer mediation, facilitations, and training like this one to strengthen the ability of diverse individuals and groups to resolve interpersonal conflicts and community issues. Our Brown Bag Lunch series is held every third Thursday at 12 noon on Zoom, and you are welcome to register on Eventbrite each time to receive the Zoom link. Our next speaker on January 19th is Thomas Grimmel, who works for HPM Building Supply. And he will be speaking on the topic, discover your core values, brave leaders live into their values. And I'm gonna put a link to register into the chat if you would like to sign up for that already. Some people do it during the talk. We also have a free in-person training on Friday, January 13th. It's called Winning Edge Leadership for Women with Sylvia Dolina. It'll be from 8.30 to 4.30 at UH Hilo. A little blurb about it. How do women learn to maneuver and succeed when advancing up the leadership ladder, especially given the additional obstacles we must overcome? Learn to access your innate talents and develop new skills for stepping powerfully into leadership. And again, I will give you the link to register. This is the, what number is this? The sixth in a seven part series, free series we're doing with Sylvia at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. So if you are here in town, please join us. At the end of the talk today, we will ask you to fill out a short online survey, which we will put in the chat box. It helps with our grant funding for this series. So please do take a moment to give us your thoughts by clicking into that link towards the end of the talk. And I will also send an email out later with the slides and the video link. And it will include another link to that survey. We really appreciate your feedback and we do share it with our speakers. Without further ado, please let me introduce our topic and speaker for today. Resilience at Work, Self-Care for Stress Management and Burnout Prevention is the name of today's talk. And our speaker is Ami Kunimura, who has recently moved back to Hilo. And um, her mother used to be one of our volunteer mediators. Am I allowed to say this and brag about your family? And your brother is on our board of directors. <clears throat> Ami is the founder of the Self Care Institute and provides. Excuse me. <laughs> Ami is the founder of the Self Care Institute and provides therapeutic support for professionals around the world who are experiencing burnout. She has presented on self care and professional burnout at international events and conferences. Ami holds a BA in psychology and an MA in music therapy and is currently pursuing a PhD in mind body medicine. She has been a board certified music therapist since 2006. And I spotted her guitar in the background um, behind her when we first got onto Zoom. So please welcome uh, Ami in a Zoom fashion. Zoom round of applause or little symbols you can put in the reactions. Welcome, welcome, Ami, please take it away. We're here right. to listen. Thank to you, Julie. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. For all of you who are here live, anyone watching the recording, um, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint in just a little bit, but I just want to start um, 
by saying that you showing up here and listening to this and watching this presentation, this is self-care. And I'm going to bring up some pretty big topics today. I'm going to be talking about burnout, stress, and self-care. But um, I want you to know that we're not just talking about self-care later. This is self-care that's happening now. And I'm going to have some practices we can do together. But I you know, just want to start by giving you credit for just showing up. When it comes to self-care, there's this weird thing that happens that even though it's really important, we can forget to do it. But you watching this is proof that you're not forgetting to do that today. So thank you for being here and doing this for yourself. So let me bring up my slides here. All right, so in today's presentation, I'm going to cover three topics and um, this will be broken down into three parts. First, I'm gonna talk about burnout and stress because self-care is a very big topic and I'm really framing self-care in the realm of burnout and stress. How do we take care of ourselves when we are feeling stressed out or when we're at risk for burnout or when we're experiencing burnout? And then um, I'm going to talk about what self-care is. You know, this is a very misunderstood term sometimes, but I want to talk about what self-care can really look like and what it's not. And then in part three, I'm going to go over five specific self-care practices for resilience that we'll do together here and that you can take with you after this presentation is over. So let's start by taking a deep breath in together. Slowly exhaling. And again, deep breath in. Try to keep your exhale long and controlled. And just one more time, take another breath naturally on your own, paying attention to your body breathing here. And again, in this moment, just thanking yourself for being here, knowing that at any given moment, the greatest gift you can give yourself or anyone else is your presence and your time. And you're not just giving me your presence and your time by listening to me here, you're giving this back to yourself. So I invite you to just try your best to be present as much as you can here. You know, you might wanna close any other browser windows, just flip your phone over if you can. But again, we're starting here with self-care, allowing this hour here to be time for you. So, when we talk about burnout and stress, these are pretty big words. So let's start by talking about what does burnout and stress actually mean? What are we trying to manage or prevent here? So I wanna start with this word burnout. Now, again, this can be a very big word. And in 2019, the World Health Organization included burnout in this, as a syndrome in the ICD-11. And so burnout as a syndrome means that burnout, it's not a disease or it's not like a mental health disorder. What a syndrome is, it's just something that you experience that has a bunch of symptoms. And so the symptoms that are identified by the World World Health Organization are first, emotional exhaustion or depleted energy. Second is negativity or cynicism about your work or about your job. And then three is reduced professional efficacy or reduced sense of accomplishment. And so these three things can make up the experience of burnout. And just to put these three things into simple terms, burnout can mean you're feeling emotionally exhausted or really tired. Um, to you're feeling just negative about your job or you're feeling just a change in attitude toward your own job. It could be like, you know, you really liked your job at first, but that passion or love for it is starting to decline. And then you're also feeling like you're not as effective at your job, even though you might be putting a lot of energy into it. And so burnout can be looked at as a syndrome like this. So, and these are some of the main symptoms, but there are other ones too. But when we talk about burnout here, um, I do wanna sort of frame this phenomenon as burnout. Um, 
as something that's bigger than it just being a syndrome, that there's three parts to this. So burnout can be a syndrome. It can be the state of being that someone can find themselves in. Again, being tired, having a negative attitude towards their job and not being as effective at work. But this word burnout can also describe a process that someone goes through. And I hear someone saying, I'm burning out. It means they're going through this process of burnout. And that process can look like going from a state of exhaustion, where you know you feel pretty tired, but usually with exhaustion, we can push through, we can work through a state of ex exhaustion, but then eventually getting to a state of depletion, where there is this feeling of emptiness, like nothing left to give. So this process is going from exhaustion to depletion, but burnout can be used to describe that entire process. And then burnout can also be used to describe bigger problems. So Burnout can be a symptom of something else. And so this can be a little bit confusing because burnout itself can have symptoms, but burnout can be a symptom of a bigger problem or an underlying problem. So we just want to be aware of the different ways that burnout can show up and the different like functions burnout can have, where again, it can be the state of being, it can be a process, or it can be a symptom or indicator of a bigger problem. And so when we look at the factors that influence burnout, these are risk factors that um, can lead to burnout. We're looking at three different categories here. We're looking at the individual factors, work and client factors, and then social and systemic factors. I'm not gonna go over every um, single item that's listed here. What's important to know is that there are these three categories of risk factors. And um, I'm gonna say something that sounds like bad news, but most working professionals, if not all working professionals are at risk for burnout. And now that's not necessarily a bad thing. So being at risk for burnout means you know, you're out there in the world trying to do something. You're putting your energy into something. Sometimes it can mean you're caring about something or somebody else or giving to other people. And that can put us at risk for burnout. But just because there's a risk doesn't mean it's going to happen. But it is important to know that we can be at risk for burnout and stress. Now, we all have our own individual factors, and um, some of these are listed here, like age, perfectionism, having a difficulty saying no, if you're going through a lot of life changes, if there's a lot of stressors in your own life right now, that can increase your own individual risk. And then there's work and client factors that we need to keep in mind here. And these are factors that have to do with your own either profession or your own work environment or the clients or people you're working with. Now, when it comes to working client factors, some of this you'll have control over, some of it you won't. We unfortunately can't really control other people or, you know, the people we're trying to help. Sometimes there'll be a resistance to it or sometimes it'll just be things that make it difficult. But our work and client factors are what we need to be aware of when it comes to occupational burnout, because burnout can decrease your effectiveness as a professional and can also um, impact your own safety at work. And this is why self-care and burnout prevention is going to be really important to manage these risk factors. And then we have social and systemic factors. So these are the bigger factors that impact just the world that we're working in right now. You know, looking at, you know, just societal changes or, you know, things that are going on socially or politically, you know, when laws change or when things change in politics or when a social structure changes somehow, this can often affect our work. And again, in this realm here in social and systemic factors are some things we really won't have that much control over some of it we will but um when it comes to these three factors here i want to emphasize that you as an individual you're just one of them so when it comes to the experience of burnout what i don't want to do is just blame the 
individual person and saying like, oh, if someone's burnt out, which is all your fault and you're not doing enough self-care, that's not the case. There's so many different factors involved. Again, some we have control over, some are just bigger things that, you know, that's going on in the world right now. But what we can focus on is our individual factors and trying to manage our own individual risk. So, you know, when it comes to burnout and stress, you know, these words can feel really heavy. It can feel like just bad news, but I do want to avoid just making burnout and stress the enemy here in this presentation. And I know these experiences can sometimes feel like these images. It can feel like an empty cup, or it can feel like, you know, a cup that's already full and someone's trying to pour more into it, or this decline in functioning, or like something's broken. And so these, um, these experiences can sometimes feel this way and they can be very challenging. But again, I want to be careful of not framing burnout and stress as the enemies here because I don't want us to approach burnout and stress as things we need to fight against. Because for one thing, if you're burnt out and stressed out, you don't have a lot of energy to be using to be fighting against things. And when we treat like burnout and stress as like the monster or the villain, we might then want to retreat and like hide and avoid the whole situation. I mean, that's one of the worst things we can do is go into this mode of avoidance. So to prevent that, instead of, you know, looking at burnout and stress as the enemies, what we can do is look at burnout and stress as messengers. So instead of like trying to hurt us or like just give us a hard time, burnout and stress are actually showing up for a reason. And they're usually trying to tell us something about something that needs to change. And so this message here in this envelope can be a lot of different things. Sometimes it's, you know, small little lifestyle changes you might be need needing to make to live a healthier lifestyle. Sometimes it's a bigger change that's needed. But again, remembering that burnout and stress, they happen for a reason. And like I just said earlier, sometimes burnout is a symptom of a bigger problem that needs to be addressed. And so it's not actually our enemies, but it's something that's trying to help us and move us forward and signal us like, hey, a change is needed here. We need to listen to this. It's similar to the experience of pain. You know, like um, if you're walking like barefoot on the ground and you stepped on a nail and you felt a sharp sensation in your foot. You want to lift up your foot, you know, clean out your wounds so it wouldn't get infected. You know, the pain is actually there to help you. It's uncomfortable, but it's saying, you know, something's going on. We need to do something about this. Similar with burnout and stress. We need to listen to the situation and see what it might be trying to tell us. But when it comes to these two terms, they are different. So burnout and stress are not the same things. Burnout tends to be more cumulative where it develops over time. For some people, it can even come on as being like surprising because it can be hard to point to just like one source of burnout and say, oh, this is the cause. And to know even when it started sometimes can be difficult because it can develop slowly over time and again, be this cumulative experience. On the other hand, stress is short-term and situational. So when we're stressed out, usually we can point to what's causing the stress. We can point to a stressor. And then a lot of times, you know, once that stressful situation is over, the stress can be managed and can go away. But um, it's when stress goes unmanaged and we're not managing the stress very well, that's when stress can turn into burnout and chronic stress is what can be really hard on our bodies and then can lead to burnout. But again, these are two different situations that we're dealing with here. So um, I do wanna talk more about what stress is and stress management. So it's likely you've heard this term, stress management, of managing our stress, but looking at, you know, what does this actually mean? So when we're managing stress, we're really looking at two things here. We're looking to manage and address the stressor. So the thing that's causing the stress and then managing the stress response. So first let's talk about the stressor. So the stressors are things that the thing that's causing the stress. And then the stressor 
will activate a stress response in our bodies. So you've likely heard of you know, chemicals like cortisol or adrenaline. Those are chemicals that are released in our bodies when we get stressed out. And that's not the only things. Um, you know, the stress response in our body can involve like 1400 chemical reactions. And again, I don't wanna make stress like the enemy here. Our bodies are designed to respond to stress. We're meant to be able to encounter a stressor and be able to do something about it. But we need to try to manage both the stressor and a stress response. So a stressor can come from the outside or it can come from inside of you. So a stressor can be, you know, a common stressor is another person causing you stress. Maybe they're behaving in a way that you don't agree with, or they said something that stressed you out, or it's a situation. I mean, a stressor can be also as simple as, you know, getting an email that says, hey, can you do this one other thing for me? And then it just feels like a burden to you, but there can be lots of stressors in our external environment. Again, some are small, some can be really big. And then there can be stressors in our internal environment. So we can be the cause of our own stress also. So our internal stressors are things like self-criticism or pressuring yourself really hard, maybe when you don't need to, or like a negative internal dialogue. But um, this is a very common source of stress and is one that can be more in our control than dealing with other people who are stressing us out. And so when it comes to managing, you know, the stressor and the stress, stress response, ideally we want to try to address both. But Sometimes this is not always possible. So, you know, sometimes if the stressor is another person and so we ask the other person like, hey, can you do something differently? And they just don't, and it's still stressing you out. What you can do then is focus on the stress response in your body, focus on what's going on in there. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a few tips on how to deal with that in just a little while. But because there are two things to manage here, what this means is that you don't have to wait for that stressor to go away in order to deal with the stress in your body. Like say the stressors just isn't something that's gonna be resolved anytime soon. Again, then you can focus on the stress response in your body. But this also means that just because the stressor does go away, doesn't mean you've completely dealt with the stress. Like say something stressed you out, activated a stress response in your body, and then the stressor did get resolved right away. That still means there is an, um, something going on in your body and we still need to resolve that stress response. So here are some ways you can address the stress response that's happening in your body. So really these are things you can do when you encounter a stressor. You can do some exercise or movement, physical activity, moving your body is very helpful. Again, these chemicals like cortisol and, and adrenaline, they're there to mobilize you. And we want to work, work through and with these chemicals, not push against them and not let them just um, sit in stagnation in your body. We can also do some deep breathing, can also help move that energy around. Breathing can calm your nervous system. Positive social interaction can also help um, expressing your emotions and creative expression. But you can see with these five things, there's this themology of releasing things, just getting things out of your body, not keeping things in, but moving through the stress response. You don't get stuck in your stress. So when it comes to stress, though, we're actually um, not trying to eliminate stress. So our goal with stress management is not just get rid of all stress for one thing that's just very unrealistic. We're going to face stressors every day. And that's actually okay, because what we're going for, especially at work, is a healthy level of stress. Because ironically, too little stress can lead to burnout. When, you're, when there's too little stress, you can get bored. There might be like this lack of meaning or this monotony feeling. You know, this lack of challenge can lead to like a lack of meaning. And you can even feel tired with too little stress being, you know, understimulated. But of course, too much stress is what we don't want to. That can be overwhelming. That can lead to burnout. That can be the sense of just being too much. 
So we want to aim for this middle zone here, having a healthy level of stress where there actually is enough stress to provide you with some challenge, to keep you alert, to feel like you're growing and learning and that there's motivation and productivity. And that can be where we can find some satisfaction and what can help you maintain a healthy level of stress is a sense of personal control, a sense of support and meaning and purpose in your work. But again, we're not trying to go for stress elimination here. We're just trying to fall in the middle of this spectrum somewhere. So when it comes to burnout and stress, you know what to do about all of this. Here are just some suggestions on places to start. So first is to face and address your challenges and stressors, to not avoid or deny your experiences. But you can do this by talking about it and getting us getting support you know, to not go through this alone, especially if you are experiencing burnout. One of my first recommendations is to not use burnout as a way to isolate yourself, use it as a way to connect with other people. But also try your best to approach your experiences with compassion. So not shaming yourself or being so hard on yourself if you're going through burnout and stress. It can be really easy to go into this space of feeling like, oh, I'm not doing things right, or I'm not good enough for my job, or being really hard on yourself. But approach your experiences with compassion. That means having some space for your own feelings. And then again, taking responsibility for what you can. But you know, like I said in the beginning here, sometimes burnout is, is a symptom of a bigger issue. And um, we cannot always take all the fault on our own shoulders for a burnout. We can take responsibility for some of it, but sometimes not all of it. And then self-care and community care. I'm gonna be talking about self-care for the rest of this presentation, but I do wanna emphasize that, you know, self-care is not the answer to everything here. Um, you know, it's not this like miracle worker that's gonna solve everything because we do need community care here. And actually this is what's happening right now. All of us coming together, learning about burnout and stress together. This is community care happening at the same time as self-care. but. Don't try to take this all on on your own. And then again, you know, listening to what burnout and stress might be communicating to you, not treating them as this enemy or trying to push them away or fighting against it, almost bringing in these experiences into your awareness with compassion and doing your best to listen to what it might be saying to you. Again, usually burnout and stress are trying to communicate that something needs to change. So I know I threw a lot of um, information out at you just now, and I am going to save time for questions at the end here. So um, you'll be able to ask questions. You're welcome. If you do have a question, you can put it in the chat and um, I'll try to keep track of that too. But I do want to make sure we have enough time to talk about self-care. But let's take a deep breath in and slowly exhale. All right, so it's likely you've heard of this term, self-care. And, you know, this is a term that's thrown around a lot. It is highly misunderstood. It's used on social media a lot. I also see it as self-care is trying to be, you know, this solution to everything. But, you know, what does, does caring for yourself or self-care, what does this actually mean? And so here's a working definition that we can use right now. So self-care can mean caring for yourself in your personal and professional roles with compassionate action and mentality. So with this definition, I want to point out, this means your personal and professional roles. So self-care is not just about your per personal roles. It's not what you just do after work or in your free time. Self-care involves your professional roles and can be a professional responsibility for you, especially because burnout can impair your own professional effectiveness and safety. And so that makes it a responsibility for you at work. And then also with self-care, we can also think about like, you know, when we think of what should I do for self-care? What does that look like? We think 
what should I do? There's this emphasis on doing. But self-care is not just about taking action and doing. Self-care is also about mentality and being nice to yourself inside your own mind, inside your own body. So self-care involves both action and mentality. It's not just about doing things, but it also is about how you treat yourself. And then when it comes to self-care, we need to know that this is a multi-dimensional experience. Um, it's not just about you know diet, sleep, and exercise. Those are really important too, but we have our physical health, emotional health, psychological health, social health, and spiritual health to think about when we think about ways we can care for ourselves. And these different dimensions all need care equally. And then when we're talking about self-care, you know, this means that it's care that's personalized to you. So this means that, you know, what's self-care for one person might not be self-care for another person or what self-care was for you five years ago might not work for you anymore. And so self-care needs to be personalized to you, your own culture, your own personality, where whatever stage you're in in life right now. But self-care also needs to be flexible and ever-changing. It needs to be able to change with your life, with your needs, and change you know, with your job or your responsibilities, what's going on in your life. And when we're practicing self-care, we're aiming for progress. We're not aiming for perfection. So just like well, our goal with stress management is not to eliminate all stress, our goal for self-care is not to have perfect balance or to do this all perfectly. Our aim is to consistently work for progress and to consistently practice self-care. So I am going to talk a lot about self-care, um, you know, in the next like 10 minutes or so, but know that you're not expected to like maintain all of this perfectly, to do the best with what you have right now. So... Here are some considerations for self-care that can help us better understand this term self-care and what this can look like for each one of us too. So our first consideration here is that you do not need to earn self-care. Sometimes we're on this reward basis with self-care where we think, you know, I'm gonna reward myself at the end of the day with like a nice bath or getting a massage once a month or something else. But I really, want to push the fact that you do not need to earn self-care, that each one of us here are human beings. And as a human being, you were born with the right to kindness and compassion and love. And that means giving yourself kindness and compassion and love. That as a living human being, you don't need to do anything else to earn self-care. You're already worthy of it. And so you don't need to earn self-care by working super hard or by giving to other people. This is a given and inherent human right that you already have. Number two is that self-care is more than just leisure and luxury. So sometimes we think self-care, you know, is about relaxation or taking a vacation, but that's just part of what self-care can be. Self-care unfortunately can include some of the more uncomfortable things like saying no or setting boundaries or, um, you know, making changes in your life or having a hard conversation. Those things aren't, you know, exactly relaxing or luxurious, but those are important forms of taking care of yourself. Number three here is that self-care and hard work can coexist. And so taking care of yourself and working hard are not opposite things. We need to bring these two things together and coexist. And also in this conversation of self-care, I'm not, I'm not against hard work here. And I'm not here to like tell you to work less or whatever, but you know, what the message I want to bring in is to allow self-care to be a part of your work and allow self-care to coexist with work. Because sometimes we can think, oh, if I'm taking care of myself, it might look like I'm not working hard enough. Or if I'm working hard, I don't have time for self-care. But we want to get rid of sort of that like um, duality in our thinking and instead bring these two things together and allow them to coexist. Because self-care can be practiced at work, and it's when you're working hard, that's when you need self-care the most. 
And then number four here is that self-care does not have to take a lot of time. One of the biggest obstacles to self-care is not having time to do it. But I'm going to share five practices here that don't take up a lot of time. And again, some of the things I've been talking about, just speaking nicely to yourself in your own mind, taking a breath once in a while doesn't have to take a lot of extra time. And then number five is self-care is not just about you. So the care you give yourself can extend to other people that can give you more energy to give to others, but also your stress and burnout will impact other people's. Other people's stress and burnout will impact yours. Even though the word self is in there, self-care is not just about you. Also, self-care will make you a more effective working professional, and that will likely impact other people too. And the number six here is that self-care is a choice to do what's best for you. So self-care is not always what's enjoyable. I know at the end of the day, when we're tired, it might be easier to just turn on Netflix and like binge watch a show and numb out and not think about anything. But the real self-care might be, you know, I'm not against Netflix or watching TV, but maybe watching one episode and turning it off and the self-care choice is getting to sleep. Even though it can be hard to get yourself to bed, it might be easier to sit there and watch TV, but self-care is a choice to do what's best for you. It's not always about what's most enjoyable or what's most comfortable. And then lastly here is that self-care is a skill that you can develop. So it might feel like um, self-care should be this like automatic life skill we should just know how to do but you know if we look at our lives you know we're constantly changing our lives are constantly changing and we do have to keep up with this and so we have to keep up our own self-care as a skill that's developed not just something that's assumed that we know how to do all right, so all these considerations, I want you to just take a moment here to think of right now, which one feels most important to you? Which one feels like you really need to grab this one and put this in your pocket and especially carry this with you for the next couple of weeks through the holidays here? And I'm curious to know which one you chose. You can just put the number in the chat box if you'd like to. But pay attention here to what feels significant to you. I encourage you to write this down and keep this as a reminder for yourself. Yes, I'm seeing number four, one, one, five, one, six. So again, this is meaningful to you. Take this with you. All right. So when it comes to self-care, we have, um, I don't have a lot of time here to go over the old all the stuff we can do to take care of ourselves, but I can bring in these different themes here. So when we think of self-care, we can often think of nourishing ourselves, nourishing ourselves with food, with sleep, with good people, with, um, you know, nice pictures to look at sometimes, with books, with media. But when we're thinking about what we're nourishing ourselves with, we're thinking about what we're bringing in. It's a very big part of self-care, but what's another big part is what we're releasing. So self-care is not just about what we're taking in, but it means letting go of certain things. It might be letting go of certain habits, might be letting go of certain people or um, releasing certain values or beliefs that are not working for you anymore. But this releasing aspect of self-care can make room for better nourishing to happen. And also we have this term at the bottom here, resourcing. So self-care, again, although the word self is in there can be a little bit misleading. Resourcing means being able to find resources, whether it's other people or support or, you know, finding a book you can read or even looking at like an article online that can help you take care of yourself. So self-care doesn't have to rest all on your shoulders. Again, this is a skill that we can get better at with time and you can use resourcing to help yourself gain resources. And again, these can be really small resources or they can be really big. It can be like a meme you see on social media that just made sense to you and taking a picture of it and reminding yourself of it. Or it can be, you know, going and getting yourself a therapist and getting professional support. So resourcing can mean you don't have to just learn all this on your own. 
All right. So with this self-care in mind, I want to give us five specific practices that we can take with us here for resilience. And I'd like you all to get out a piece of paper if you can and write these down. Some of these you'll be personalizing for yourself. So just a um, piece of paper or notepad um, would be fine. So I have five practices. All of these are meant to not take a lot of time. So our first practice here is what I call compassionate self-inquiry. And that can be just a fancy way of saying, asking yourself nice questions. And so let's practice this together. Let's take a deep breath in. As you slowly exhale, bring one hand towards your chest, towards your body. Just let your hand relax over your body. If you'd like to, you can close your eyes just for a little bit here. And as you sit with yourself, I'd like you to ask yourself the question, what do I need right now? What do I need right now? Asking yourself gently, just with curiosity, not forcing any response. Again, asking yourself, what do I need right now? Seeing what might come up for you. Take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, relaxing your hands, gently opening your eyes. And that's compassionate self-inquiry. Again, it's, it simply means asking yourself a question, but you're doing so compassionately you're bringing the awareness to yourself. And um, here are some other questions you can ask yourself, like in a time of stress, or if you're like highly emotionally, um, highly emotional in a moment, you might ask yourself like, oh, how do I feel about this? Or if you're trying to make a decision, bringing in compassionate self-inquiry to help you through this. You could even ask, you know, what is my body telling me? Or there could be other questions you think of on your own too. But I encourage you to write these questions down also write down if anything did come up for you when you're asking yourself, what do I need right now? But compassionate self-inquiry just means engaging yourself in this compassionate process that can just support caring for yourself. Doesn't have to take a long time. This can also help to increase self-awareness, but you're doing so with kindness and curiosity. You know, it's very easy for us to ask ourselves questions with judgment and criticism, but this we're bringing in, in compassion. And what we're not doing is making demands of ourselves. So we're just focused on the question, not so much the response. So again, compassionate self-inquiry, it's just asking yourself, questions. And this question of what do I need right now, that can be an important way for you to check in with yourself. Number two here is completing the stress cycle. So like I talked about earlier in this presentation with stress management, what we want to do is complete this stress cycle. So the stress cycle started with a stressor that came in it activated a stress response in your body. And then now your job is to do something to complete the stress cycle and do something about the stress response in your body. And again, some ways to move through this is through exercise or movement, breathing, social interaction, expressing your emotions or creative expression. So right now in this moment, I'd like you to identify a current stressor. You can write this down. If I identify a stressor, could it be a big one? Could it be a small one? Identify what the stress feels like. And then identify one way you can complete the stress cycle and be specific with yourself. So write this down. Again, writing down what's your current stressor. Write down what does the stress feel like? And then make a choice. Think of one way you can complete the stress cycle and be specific. So for example, being specific means like if you're, you're choosing exercise, not just writing down exercise, but being specific, like saying, I'm going to go take a walk outside for 20 minutes after work today, or I'm going to do a half hour of yoga, or um, 
you know, I'm going to choose this podcast and yeah, listen to it while I take a jog or whatever that means or movements can mean I'm going to, you know, dance to this specific song later in the day or breathing can mean sitting yourself down and taking a few breaths or positive social interaction. Choose a person to talk to and decide how you're going to communicate with them. You're welcome to put this in the chat box if you'd like to. Sometimes our, um, when we share ideas, it can help stimulate ideas for other people. But think of what's one way you can complete the stress cycle and think of what might be realistic for you here. There's no real right or wrong here. And again, our goal here is not to just eliminate all the stress, but our goal here is to do something about the stress that's happening in our bodies. All right, the third practice here is compassion. So compassion is a very big word. And what it can generally mean is just having a sense of warmth, acceptance, and caring for yourself or for somebody else. And compassion can be a way to counteract the fatigue that's caused by empathy. So being empathetic with other people or like, you know, trying to help other people with their issues or problems or, you know, connecting with what other people are feeling, that can sometimes be draining. It takes a lot of energy to connect with other people's emotions. But compassion, on the other hand, doesn't mean connecting with someone else's emotions. It means being able to hold them in a space of acceptance and warmth. So I'd like us to practice a compassion exercise together. So first, take your hands and gently place it on your chest. This here is a gesture of self-compassion. Here, this can be a nice, soothing gesture. Now, as you slowly inhale, breathe in compassion for yourself. So breathe in a sense of warmth and acceptance for yourself. As you exhale, breathe out compassion and send compassion out to someone else. Try that breathing again. Inhale, breathe in compassion for yourself. Fill your body with compassion. Exhale, think of another person to send compassion to. Send compassion mentally to them. Try this one more time. Inhale, compassion for yourself. And then exhale, breathe out compassion. Let's send compassion out to everyone else in the world. And relaxing your hand down. So this compassion practice can be a good one to do if you're feeling overwhelmed with someone else's emotions. If there's someone like you're worried about, but you feel like you're having a hard time helping them or you're um, feeling overwhelmed with just the events of the world, this is a way you can bring compassion into yourself, send it out to other people, but also this is centering to yourself. And it's a practice in filling yourself up first before giving to somebody else. All right, our practice number four here is six deep Breath. So first I want to explain this. Um, there was a Japanese research study done with over 25,000 working professionals that found the number of six is the magic number of deep breaths that can change your physiology. So it means sitting down and taking six breaths can reduce your blood pressure. This can reduce your heart rate. This can also just reduce the overall sensation of stress in your body and your mind. And so actually in our compassion practice, we already took three breaths. So we just have three more breaths to take together now. Well, let's do that so we can complete our six breaths together. So inhale, breath number four. Slowly exhale. We breathe. We want to try to keep our exhale longer than our inhalation. And again, number five in. And out. And last breath together in. And out. So six breaths, this, this can, you know, seem pretty simple. And, you know, when you are having a day where there's a lot going on, you can take this six 
these six breaths with someone else. You can do this while you're walking. You can, you know, bring this as a tool in, in the morning or in the evening to um, kind of center yourself. But self-care doesn't have to be that complicated. If you can remember the number six, remember to breathe, you can do this. And then our last practice here is identifying your true purpose of self-care. So in this presentation, you know, have framed self-care in relation to burnout and stress where self-care can help us manage our stress. It can help us prevent burnout. But really in the big picture of life, we want to find a reason for self-care that goes beyond burnout prevention. So we're not actually just practicing self-care just so we don't get burnt out. There's a bigger picture here and there can be a bigger reason why self-care is important to you. I call this having your true purpose of self-care. So think about right now, what can self-care help support you with in your life? And here are some examples of other people's purposes of self-care. It can be, you know, self-care can help you experience happiness and joy to be more present with your loved ones to enjoy your time here in this life to have more energy to experience life or to contribute your own gifts in meaningful ways but i'd like you to write down what is your true purpose of self-care because this will be your motivation for self-care because sometimes if we're just doing self-care to prevent burnout or you know decrease stress sometimes it's not a big enough motivation but we're looking at what is it, what do you really want to experience in life and what, how can self-care support you with that? And if you'd like to, you can, again, put this in the chat box, but you can keep this to yourself also. But again, your true purpose of self-care is a reason beyond burnout prevention, but this is a very significant purpose for you to take with you out of this workshop here. All right. So with all of this said, there's an overall theme here of resilience and what is resilience? So resilience can be the ability to bounce back. Resilience can also mean picking yourself up instead of beating yourself up. Resilience can mean facing stress and burnout and moving through it in a meaningful way. Resilience can mean adapting to change or creating change. And then this last thing here is resilience can mean responding to stress with self-care. And that's what we're going to do again and again every day is responding to stress with self-care in big ways and in small ways. And that's what it can mean to be resilient. Remember, resilience doesn't mean having to be strong all the time or having to solve everybody's problems. It can simply mean bouncing back or responding to stress with self-care. All right, so to wrap this up, two things I want to remind you of is that burnout and stress are messengers. Listen to what they're trying to tell you. Again, they're not here to really hurt you or give you a hard time, but burnout and stress are experiences that contain really important messages. And then so self-care is a skill we can build throughout life. We need to practice self-care, not expect ourselves to be perfect at it. So thank you. Um, again, my name is Ami. You can find me at Self-Care Institute. I'll put this link in the chat also. Um, but my website is selfcareinstitute.com. I have free self-care resources available here. I have free guided meditations. Uh, my most popular self-care resource is called Take a Moment. It's an email that goes out every Wednesday that sends self-care reminders, self-care education, self-care practices to um, keep your self-care practices nourished. Again, funny thing happens with self-care that it's so important, but yet we can forget about it in our busy week. And I intentionally send this out on Wednesdays so that in the middle of the week, you can get this nice self-care nudge to say like, hey, don't forget, self-care is here too. All right, so we have about five minutes left. I do want to see if there are any questions here. And again, I'll put... Um, I'll put the link to my website in the chat box here. 
So um, if you have a question, the best way to do it is use the reactions where raise hands. See how it pops me to the front of the screen so that we can see that there's a question. And then when you've finished asking your question, you can lower your hand. Also, I've put the link to our feedback survey for this talk. Please do click on that and fill it out before uh, we're done. Raju, I see you've un, uh, hidden yourself. Would you like to ask a question? Um, thank you for that presentation. That was wonderful. You're welcome. How does um, <clears throat> how do you know what are the signs like the benchmark for self care when it when it's moving because of like COVID and other stresses that are a little bit more than what we've been dealing with. Yeah, that's a really good question. And yeah, I mean, you know, the current events have had a really big impact on burnout and stress and self-care. And so before the pandemic, burnout and stress are already issues. The pandemic really exacerbated burnout and stress, but it did get us to a point where like we couldn't ignore it anymore. And with self-care, for a lot of us, we were forced to bring self-care in because we really needed it. And I think the pandemic also helped support us in taking a look at our own health and our own risks and being able to um, take a look at that in an honest way and trying our best to manage our own risks. And Raj, I think you asked, you know, what are some of the benchmarks we can be looking for here? So first, when it comes to burnout and stress, your own energy level, your mood, and your relationships can be ways you can look at how burnout and stress are impacting your life. So first, your own energy levels. That can sometimes be obvious, um, sometimes not. Our energy levels will fluctuate. It, it's very natural. We're not going to be um, just high energy all the time. We don't have to expect that of ourselves. But if we notice that our energy levels are consistently very low, that's a time to bring in self-care. Also, our moods and our emotions will be very powerful signals to bring in self-care. When I mean, we're having this consistently low moods, we're going to want to um, bring in some nourishment or nurturing for ourselves. And then also our relationship health will tell us something about our self-care because then our self-care is not just about ourselves, but if we were struggling in communicating with other people or keeping, you know, having time for others, or, you know, if there's a lot of conflict in our relationships, these can be signals that we ourselves need to replenish ourselves and focus on self-care. And then the benchmarks with self-care we can look at is when we look at what is being depleted, like for example, our energy or our um, emotions or you know our social life, what's being depleted, we wanna focus there first in trying to fill that up. And it can be sometimes hard to even like gauge what's going on. So sometimes the best places to start is with those five practices that I mentioned, because those practices will help you check in with yourself, the compassionate self-inquiry. It'll give you some practices to help you calm down your nervous system so that you can actually take a look at what's going on. Because sometimes in a heightened state, it's hard to figure out what's going on or what to even do for self-care. But to first calm down our nervous system so we can make an informed decision about what to do for self-care. Because I know with all of you, your time is so precious. And what we want to do is make an informed decision for self-care that's going to be effective and not just something that's um, you know going to add to your stress. But thank you for asking that. Thank you, Amy. Um, thank you, Ben. I saw that you had something in the chat. Um, is that and then I saw you come live on the screen. Did you want to ask that question yourself? Oh my God, he came live. He was asking about in the chat about an early researcher on stress named um, Hans, S-E-L-Y-E, but he's not sure on that spelling. It, do you know about that work and is it still relevant? Um, let me see, I'm trying to find it in the chat box. It's I'm free, not... It was at 1227. Oh, okay, thank you, that's helpful. 
Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that research. I'll go look that up though. Yeah. Hans. And we have some other comments and comments in the um, chat, including one question from Indy, who's mm -hmm. asking how valuable is being involved with civic engagement with improving self-care? In other words, does not being involved or being frustrated with local government affect our nervous systems? Oh, that's a really good question. And that varies by person. And so civic engagement can actually, it can very much support your self-care. For one thing, it can connect you with other people and help give you a sense of purpose and feel like you're doing something about something. And that can be very motivating and nourishing and replenishing for people. On the other hand, for some other people, being involved with civic engagement can be very stressful and create another kind of burnout that's called activist burnout. And so we just have to gauge where you might be at a particular time in your life. And so there's no um, easy answer for this, but um, again, self-care is not the answer to everything and self civic engagement with improving self-care can definitely provide support, but it can also be draining. It can go either way. And so um, just monitoring your own response to that is, um, is necessary. But oh yeah, sometimes it both can happen too, where you know you can be involved in meaningful work and giving back, but that can also be draining. So, you know, just um, creating some type of boundaries around that might be helpful too. But I've done a lot of research on activist burnout, which is an entirely another presentation here. But there's um, an, other forms of burnout out there that an occupational burnout's not the only one. Let's see. We're a little bit over, and it's an engaged group with most everyone still on here. So I'm wondering if there's any other questions, if um, if anyone's brave enough to unmute themselves or raise their hands. I think I've gotten to all the questions in the chat. There was various comments as we went along. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Okay, well. I haven't seen anyone else unmute themselves or put a new question in the chat. Um, please do um, take a minute to fill out our short online survey. You just click into the chat and it comes up. It's just a few questions. It does help us with our grant funding for this free series. Thank you so much for doing self-care today and coming. I don't know about you, but I certainly like that breathing and I've taken some notes and have some good ideas for myself. So I hope you all feel the same. Um, please do check your email in the next day or two. I will be sending out the slides and the video link. And can you please join me in giving a very warm Zoom uh, round of appreciation for Ami. Oh, thank you, everyone. Woohoo, Ami! Yeah! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Please have a peaceful and self-caring holiday season.